Hello folks, good afternoon, welcome. Hello Jose, welcome, welcome. How are you doing Eric? Good, good. Uh, just here uh, trucking along. <laughs> How are you Jose? Uh, I'm doing good for the circumstances, right? <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, we have a couple of folks that are uh, expected to to participate. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure I, um, I admit everyone before we get started. Uh, just as a disclaimer, we are uh, recording uh, this meeting. Um, just wanted to shout that out, but no worries for the students that are participating. Your, your videos can be uh, turned off. Um, so no worries there. Uh, I see uh, Brian Valdez. How's it going, Brian? Uh, sorry, there you go. How's it going, Brian? Good, how are you? Good, good. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and then I also see uh, Leah Martinez. Good afternoon. How are you? Hello. How are you, everyone? <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Um, still waiting for a couple of more folks. All right, and for the, uh, the folks that are just joining us right now, uh, we, we will be recording this session. Um, so you, you'll also have uh, access to it later if, if, you, um, if you wanted to, to go over what we uh, talked about today, okay? Um, we're just waiting for one more instructor and then we'll go ahead and get started. And Eric, just letting you know, it seems like we also have other um, instructors that are, you know, in the Zoom. Carl Ar Aragundi and, uh, and Skip Riccardi. Okay. So hopefully they can share their experiences as well if they want to. Okay, uh, that, that sounds good. Uh, let me just uh, find them here. Uh, you said Skip and who was the other one? Carl Aragundi, I'm here. Oh, awesome. How's it going, Carl? Great. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for joining us today. Glad um, to awesome. And we're just waiting on, um, let's see, uh, Yadira, are you uh, on the call? No. Okay. Uh, maybe she's running a little late. Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining me today um, and joining us for this uh, virtual teacher panel as part of the uh, STEM CT Teach uh, Team Mentorship Workshop Series. Uh, my name is Eric Rodriguez and I'm with STEM CT Teach. Uh, for the folks that aren't familiar with us, we provide services and support to students that are interested in becoming uh, teachers and pursuing uh, teaching as a career. Uh, the team mentorship program uh, matches a student interested in teaching uh, with a professor for a semester of shadowing. Uh, the student has the opportunity to learn firsthand uh, from some of our exceptional instructors here at uh, Rio Hondo College uh, what it's like to teach. Uh, most of the student panel participants today uh, are students that are part of Rio Hondo College and uh, many of them are actually part of a team mentorship uh, this semester. Um, so today we are joined by a couple of different instructors uh, who are excited to share out their experiences with their teaching pathways uh, and will answer questions that you submitted during the uh, registration process. Um, uh, hello, Yadira. How's it going? <laughs> Okay, all right, folks, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, our panel today. Uh, if we can just go around um, with the instructors and you can share out um, your name, uh, what area you teach, uh, where do you teach, and how long you've been teaching. Uh, we can go ahead and get started with uh, Jose Milan. Hi, everyone. Um, like was mentioned by Eric, my name's Jose, uh, Jose Milan. And I teach in the architecture, civil, and engineering uh, drafting design uh, here at Rio Honda College. And I've been teaching for about five years now. Awesome. Thank you, Jose. Uh, and next, if we can have uh, uh, Brian Valdez, please. 
Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Valdez. I am a kindergarten teacher and I work for the ABC Unified School District. I've been teaching for a total of seven years and counting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, and next, if we can have uh, Yadira Arellano. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I thought I was muted. Um, let me. Uh, so hello everybody, I'm trying to adjust myself. I have a one bedroom and I'm trying to stay away from my child. He keeps following me around. Um, no worries. <laughs> so hello everybody, my name is Yelida Arellano. I um, teach child development at Rio Hondo College and uh, El Camino College. And was that, was that all I was supposed to say? Um, and how long you, uh, have you been teaching for? Um, I've been teaching for about eight years now um, in different capacities. I started teaching uh, parents. So I used to work at a Head Start and I started doing um, parenting workshops. And then I started, was also a preschool teacher. So that's how I started teaching and then eventually made myself way over to the college system. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shadira. Um, and next, uh, if we can have uh, Skip. There we go. Hello. How's it going? All right, man. So I've been teaching for over a dozen years now uh, in the college setting, but uh, as part of my um, part of my profession is what I do. I do training uh, for companies uh, as part of a consulting firm, as well as uh, putting together uh, environmental programs and permits for the. Uh, Companies that I work for, for awesome. over, for, been doing this for over, well, actually almost forty years now. Forty wow. years, wow, that's that's uh, uh, that's great. That means uh, that means that you like it, right? <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you so much for sharing. Um, bye bye. And, yeah, um, and <laughs> next we have a uh, Carl. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Carl Aragendi. <clears throat> I've been teaching part-time with Rio Honda College uh, in the kinesiology department for about uh, just over 10 years now. Um, before that, I was a CTE health teacher for uh, an ROP and then became a coordinator of uh, CTE after that. And now I'm also working as an uh, administrator for Sciatec Charter Schools. Um, so I have about 10 years of teaching experience. Awesome. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much, folks. We have, uh, as you can all see, we have a lot of uh, different instructors with uh, different uh, uh, walks of life, right? Uh, teaching at, at different capacities. Uh, so we're super excited to hear about what uh, just the all, all around encompassing uh, experience part of your, your teaching careers. Uh, we'd love to start off by um, asking each of you what your teaching pathway looked like. Uh, so this can be uh, anything in regards to um, what did you study in school uh, as an under, undergraduate student? Uh, what kind of credentialing program uh, did you enroll in? Uh, if there were any tests that you had to take, uh, field hours that you completed, uh, just stuff along the lines of that. Um, and we can uh, keep the same uh, rhythm that we had with um, the order of instructors. So we can start off with Jose. Yeah, so my uh, teaching pathway um, actually started at Rio Hondo. Um, I was a student there. I was actually majoring in architecture. And uh, then the CTA teach program came around. I met Leah for the first time and uh, I did a year long mentorship with two of my uh, professors. And from there, I made the decision that I was going to pursue it. So I ended up transferring to uh, Cal State LA because they're the only program around in the area that does an industrial technology for the undergrad for teaching. Um, while I was there, I went, I was enrolled in the Charter College of Education. Um, and the, the CTE field is, is a field that's very niche. Um, there's a good need for it. And so um, I was one of the only instructors there um, that was actually pursuing that field of CTE. Uh, I ended up finishing my credential through LACO um, and receiving a de designated subjects credential. And I ended up teaching at the high school for about four years before um, I moved over full time back to Rio Hondo. So that's kind of been my, my journey. I, I didn't think I was going to do teaching until this program. And then I fell in love with it and everything else kind of fell in place after that. 
Well, you really did the uh, uh, the whole circle back, right? Started yeah. with us, and and you're not with us. <laughs> so that's awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Jose. Um, what about you, Brian? Okay, everybody. Well, my teaching pathway started right after I graduated high school back in 2006. And that's when I uh, went to Cerritos College and I enrolled myself in the teacher track program that they have there. And teacher track provided me with counseling and guidance and I met wonderful people along the way. At the same time, I was able to, you know, be placed in the classroom and have observation hours and have hands-on experience with the with the kids working one-on-one -on -one or working with small groups or reading stories aloud, stuff like that. I was able to build relationships with master teachers as well that I still actually keep in touch today. And so it's really nice because, you know, you build that sense of community with each other and it's like, you can always go back and say, hey, what are you doing? Or, you know, how is this working for you? So on and so forth. So it was pretty neat. And Teacher track helped me transfer to CSUOB, Cal State Long Beach, back in 2008. And that's when I ended up, you know, continuing my career to take my Methodist courses and to student teach and do all of that. And so I student taught in a third grade classroom and fourth grade classrooms at the time. And after doing all of that, I was able to graduate. And I was working at a preschool right after I graduated college for two years. And so after teaching for uh, two years, I said, okay, it's time for me to get myself out there. And that's when I started to interview for, you know, for positions out there. I got hired as a kindergarten teacher the third year after, you know, teaching preschool for two years. So, uh, so I was able to teach my first year, I was teaching sixth grade. And then the year after that, I was asked to move down to kindergarten. So I've been in kinder ever since. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Um, uh, Yadira, do you mind going next? Oh, okay. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at everybody's and I feel as teachers, um, we go through different pathways, right? I think everybody took a different pathway and I'm hearing Ryan and I heard Jose's and it's, it kind of resonates a lot to, I feel, um, what every student goes through and then when once you become teaching so my pathway started off a little bit the same i did um i started off working you know with my pathway became i think with children really like i i started doing the i was president of a child development club when i was in college and i my first initial major was going to be chemistry and that was going to be my pathway and when i started i really did uh, get discouraged because I, I found a lot of obstacles when I was doing my um, chemistry sort of pathway. Uh, there was no really a, not a lot of support. And I took a child development class like a lot of students do because you need it for your humanities section. And they told me it was gonna be easy. And I was like, I'll take it. Um, was it easy? No. Um, but you know what? I'm so glad I took it and I'm so glad I, I struggled with it. I actually failed the first two child development classes. I failed because I wasn't putting in the effort and I failed because I wasn't taking it seriously. And I think it was that same instructor who knocked sense into me and basically sort of sat with me and guided me. She made it seem like if she was able to be there, then I can do it too. And so right after those failed courses, I want to tell you that I started really focusing so much on school. Um, I, I am a AB 540 student or when I was in school, there was no such thing yet. AB 540 hadn't come around. So I was an undocumented student. And it took me about nine years to finish my teaching career when I was in college because, because I was going in and out, right? In and out. But uh, nevertheless, I did that. I kept on with school. I didn't give up. And I remember that I stuck to this instructor and her name is Maria Rivas and she still teaches at East LA College. And up to this day, she's been a mentor for me and I kind of stuck with her. I kind of, if something was happening, I would go to her. If I didn't know what class to take, even if the counselor had told me something else, I would go run it by her. So that kind of became my teaching career. I started um, right after East LA College working at Suva Elementary as a preschool teacher. And I continued there. And then I became the parent advocate advocator. And then I worked for um, different programs like within the Head Start. And then I started uh, teaching for CalWORKs program at East LA College. I was a, parent, um, a parenting workshop coordinator. 
And then I started doing the parenting workshops once I finished my bachelor's. And then I kind of got into uh, teaching college. They offered me a parenting course at East LA College, and that's how I started my career. Nice. Uh, th those were uh, um, like a lot of different steps that you had to take, right? And like you said, uh, the, the pathways usually have a, a similar resonance to it, but they're all very unique to, to your own experience, which mm -hmm. I think is, is pretty fascinating. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing. Um, we can hear from you, um, uh, Skip. Hi again. Well, I just want to tell you something. I didn't go through a formal training program. Okay, I started off in the government and it was required on, under the other, as you know, looking at my job description, uh, the, it said there that um, you had to teach under the uh, as other duties as required program. So that was one of the things that uh, is part of my, as my job duty, working in the government with EPA, with the DOT, Highway Patrol, and all those folks. It was one of those things that I was forced to do. And so no one ever taught us or taught me and everyone else who was in, pro, in, in, our, in the uh, agencies that here's what you needed to do. We, we made it up as we, we, uh, as we went along. And so going to workshops and, uh, and conferences, looking at how people teach and their methods, that's how we came up and did this program. Uh, that's how I got into this uh, program. You know, I was forced on it, okay? And, and as I tell my students, in many of the, uh, when you're in the environmental health and safety business, it is our job to teach people how to stay, how to stay safe, how to protect human health in the environment and ed educate them on the rules and regulations that require us to, to comply with laws. And so this is how I got into this. I was um, uh, invited to come over to, uh, to do a, uh, a presentation at Rio Hondo College. And a friend of mine said, Steve, you know, Steve, uh, said, hey, you could do this. And I said, do what? I go, you could teach classes here. And I said, okay, well, what do you need me to do? And I just go, you can help me and teach some of these courses. We have a lot of courses that we want to put together for the environmental technology and science classes, and you can do this. And I said, all right, just sign me up and I'll see what I can do for it and help you guys out. And that's how it went. And I've been doing this ever since, since 2006, uh, yeah, Rio Hondo, so, and uh, going through flex and learning how to do pedagogy uh, train, uh, teaching and learning the rules in education. Um, that, that's how I got into this field. So it wasn't something that I was really, actually it's not, it, it's part of the passion of doing this is in, in my line of work because this is what I, I have to put together health and safety and, and environmental programs and have to educate people on how to, how to stay in compliance. And I've uh, spoken in, in front of people that over a thousand folks at, uh, at conferences and telling them and advising them on how to stay in, in compliance. And these are using the, uh, using obviously in a classroom setting. This is not my, my gig, uh, this, this uh, television type program here. Uh, this is not how I, I, I roll. Um, um, I'm finding it very difficult because this is, uh, I'm actually very animated and to sit here uh, looking at you uh, Eric and the rest of you folks is not the, is not the type of uh, setting that um, I like teaching in. So that's one of the things I'm sure you will be talking about that. But um, this is uh, the uh, the benefits and the downside of doing what we're doing here today. So any other if there's any other questions? And I, I I'm, I'm happy that we have students here that are actually um, that are even considering. And uh, one of them uh, is Senya, uh, who's, who's my ment mentee, 
and I telling her is that we we do this because we have to and we're doing this not because obviously in a setting like uh, in, in the classroom setting but it's a requirement under our field of uh, environment health and safety so this is why I encourage many of the students to do to do a, to do these programs here because in one way or in one way or another you will be doing you will be required to teach or present something that will um, uh, require you to stand up and talk in front of people and so I'll never forget the um, one of the counselors at our um, at Rio Hondo and one of the um, we have an advisory committee meeting uh, that. Um, that we put together every year and the industry people say we need people that know how to speak that know how to write and if they if they can't do that then why do we have you guys at Rio Hondo and that was one of the that was one of the things that enforced us or I should say uh, made it a made it a point that the students will have to speak in front of our class so in one in one form or fashion and give a presentation on a subject that uh, I either subject that I um, assign or something that they they pick to um, to uh, to convey a message and have have someone learn and, and from them what the message is so there's no matter what we're all teachers in life so that's right. that's the bottom line basically awesome well uh thank you so much uh skip it sounds like uh, you you're very passionate about the content that you're teaching right um and you know the importance of passing that knowledge down to the next generation of folks so uh that that's awesome uh we're super happy that you're on the real honda uh team Thank you. Well, that's why we're all here, right? Right. Uh, right. Uh, we're all here because we, we acknowledge the importance of, of education, right? And we want to make sure that we're able to pass that down to the next generation of folks so they can continue the legacy. Um, awesome. Thank you, uh, Skip. And if we can hear from you, Carl, what your uh, teaching pathway uh, mm -hmm. looked like. Sure, yeah, I, I too didn't go directly into uh, teaching and into education. Um, I, I uh, have a couple of degrees from Rio Hondo College and a couple of certificates as well from Rio on my way to uh, becoming a doctor of chiropractic. That's what I, I knew I wanted to be for a very long time. And um, I went through that program and I loved it and uh, loved a lot of the professors that I had. And then after I graduated about two or three years, I had the itch of going back to school. I know it sounds crazy, especially to a student right now that's in school. They're like, once I'm done, I'm done. I'm done. But uh, sometimes you go through and you're done and you're like, boy, I really enjoyed just being in school. Um, so I went back for a master's degree in health, health science education um, and did that because I wanted to give back to students and I wanted to be that professor that I looked up to when I was a student. Um, so I did that and then there was an opening at an ROP to be a health instructor and I thought hey that would be cool I could use my what I learned in my master's degree uh, but you needed a career technical education uh, uh, credential and because I had a lot of uh, health sector experience I was able to get that credential um, and I also got a business credential because I op opened my own business and I had uh, they allowed me to get marketing sales and service because of my experience as well. So with that career, with that CTE or designated subject uh, teaching credential, I was able to teach at the high school level. Um, and then, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. That was my, my zigzag pathway into becoming a, a teacher. And now I'm a, a school administrator. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as everyone can see, there is really no universal path to becoming a teacher, right? Uh, everyone's uh, journey is... Uh, a, a little bit uh, different, uh, sometimes even unique to their own experiences. Um, and uh, everyone might start at the same spot, but uh, as soon as you get there, uh, you can see that your path was just totally different, right? And, and each path is, is okay, right? Uh, the, I don't think there is, a, a, like I said, a universal right way to do, uh, to, do, uh, to do this, right? This thing that's called education. Um, Awesome, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and get moving. Uh, one question submitted by one of our students is, um, is 
is there anything that you wish you'd known as a first year teacher? Um, so this is, maybe, maybe for some of you, this is gonna require you to look back a little, right? Um, but if you can share out what, what would have been like a great advice that you, uh, that you would have loved to know um, as your first year teaching. We can start off again with you, Jose. Yeah, looking back, um, man, it, it seems like such a long time ago, but um, something I like to compare teaching to, um, it may seem a little, uh, you know, a, a weird comparison, but it's, it's to cooking or to baking. Like you get all these ingredients, so you get all your supplies, and then you have to figure out how you're gonna combine all these things with your students. And then you put it in the oven or you put, you know, you start cooking and you hope that you cook it at the right temperature and, you know, you're, you're most likely not going to get the perfect meal the first time you cook it. Just like in teaching, you're not going to get uh, the perfect lesson and now everything's going to go exactly how you plan it, uh, especially during that first year because you're really just learning how to handle all those responsibilities. You're learning how to handle all the interactions. So um, preparation is really important. Preparation is key. Um, but some things you just have to learn through experience. And I feel like that's one of the unique things about education is that a lot of it is learning by trial and error. Um, you're going to make mistakes. And that's actually a good thing because you're going to learn a lot from those mistakes. Um, and it's just going to be a, a practice and, and, a, and a process of repetition. And so th that's something I wish I knew going in. I, every time I come up short, I felt terrible. I was like, man, what, should I be doing this? What am I doing wrong? But as I gained experience and as I uh, met more uh, teachers and got to meet, you know, talk to them about their pathway, I realized that that's part of the process is really just, you know, making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. And then you slowly start to see, I mean, now I look back at some of the stuff I did and, and, I, and I feel a great sense of accomplishment of like, man, I've come so far. Like I would have taught this a completely different way, but now with the experience I have, I know the right way to approach it. So that's one of the things I wish I would have known. Nice. Uh, thank you, Jose. Now, uh, now you can pass that, right? What you would have loved to know on your first year to uh, the folks that you're mentoring right now. Uh, it's just uh, an awesome circle that we're able to do here. Uh, awesome. Thank you again, Jose. Uh, Brian, what about you? So just like Jose was mentioning right now, I totally agree. Your first year, um, it's always trial and error, but for me, especially, um, I believe I had two first years because my first year I was teaching sixth grade and then my second year I went down to kindergarten. So um, you basically go from one curriculum to another and th keep in mind, sixth grade is one grade level and kindergarten is way down there. So they're completely different. So I had no idea what I was doing my first two years when I was teaching. But again, it just falls back to trial and error. You have to find what works for you and what doesn't. Now, something that I wish somebody would have told me when I was in college was how to actually manage or control extreme behaviors. Unfortunately, uh, in today's world, we're seeing behaviors that we have never seen before, especially in primary, because of the exposure to many things. For example, technology or you know, iPads, cell phones, computers, whatever. These kids don't have social skills. So when I was in college, I mean, I only took like one or two courses in classroom management or behavior and everything else was just theory, which is great. It comes in handy, but at the same time, it's like, how can I control a tier three behavior of a child who is tossing chairs across the room, throwing scissors or poking himself or poking the teacher, stuff like that. Like, how do you control that? How do you manage that? So, um, you know, I'm not sure how it is today in college because I've been out of college for, I don't know how many years now, and I went back to get my master's in education. And even then I wasn't, you know, they didn't give us any management or uh, behavior courses taking um, it online. But again, it's just oh, finding ways to problem solve. So I was able to go back and get help from my district and talk to people there and you know, talk to colleagues or whatever, and how to control all of, all of that. But that's something that I wish somebody would have told me at the beginning, how to control behaviors that are extreme. Wow, I, I've never considered that, how uh, somebody teaching now, let's say, uh, kindergarten would be super different than, uh, it's let's say... Very, very different. Yes, very, very different. Because of all these uh, uh, new influences that, that we're seeing. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Brian. Uh, Yadira, can we hear from you now? Absolutely. I am over here nodding my head and just uh, 
validating what Jose and Brian just said. And when Brian said, you know, it's different teaching sixth grade and teaching kindergarten, absolutely. It's different teaching kindergarten and teaching preschool. It's a completely, right? Like if you go from A and then it's Z. So, uh, and, and I wanted to validate that because I think that the, the part that I feel lucky about is that my career is, um, my, with the emphasis is in child development. And a lot of with that came a lot of developmental behaviors. Uh, learning about how we develop, learning about how we process things, how children process them, how they learn, what's the best way to adapt. And so that really, really helped me out when I was teaching, because I started teaching preschool. Um, and then, and right now, like jump from preschool, then jump to college, parents, and then right now I actually teach dual enrollment. So I teach a lot of uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors because I teach the dual enrollment. So I've experienced the different types of uh, developmental stages, um, going from preschool, adults, to teenagers. And um, I would just thinking right now, like, you know, where I am right now, and when I first started teaching, I wanna say that just like Jose said, we have to learn to, it's a learning process. And I tell these to my mentees, I don't know if they're on the, on the meeting, but, we were having a conversation last week because I, one of my mentees had mentioned to me how she felt a little bit overwhelmed doing kind of like a presentation um, in this group of with this group of people. And she asked me, like, you know, maybe this isn't for me, you know, teaching. It felt so overwhelming. I felt like I wasn't doing something right. And I basically told her, well, welcome to teaching. Welcome to teaching, because that is exactly what you feel in the beginning and i don't know if any of you have felt that but when i started teaching i constantly thought my to myself oh my god am i doing it right you know what if they're not learning oh you know what if my lesson is boring are they even looking at me like all these things are are, are going through my head and i'm up there lecturing and i learned i learned that yes we're all going to make mistakes i feel that that makes us humans and that makes us you know we are teachers but we are humans and I feel that I've learned so much from those mistakes. So I don't look at them as mistakes. I look at them like stepping stones for me. You know, I've learned that my students learn better when I can become human. So I take off this shield of being a teacher and just sit with them and just, hey, you're not understanding something. Where do we, you know, where do we start off? Because maybe the way that I'm portraying something or the way that I'm lecturing something is not going through to them. So I've learned now to be able to be okay with that to be okay and sit there and ask my students, hey, um, you didn't understand it, please help me help you, basically, so that we can make this you know, journey so that you can learn. And I feel that I've learned that now, but um, really to, to, to give an advice to these students is be human. It's okay to make mistakes. We all have been there. And that's basically your stepping stone. If you don't make mistakes, then there's something wrong, honestly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Shadira. And thank you for mentioning the, um, uh, the you leveling down with your students, right? Sometimes we, as mm -hmm. students, we see the professors and instructors yeah. something, uh, uh, you know, like uh, not error prone, right? They're perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And compare. Um, but I mean, a lot of research shows that when instructors level down with their students, uh, they just learn better. Uh, and, and I think, and I think, um, you know, I've gotten, I feel now, um, you know, I think that as teachers, we have, we, we have so much pressure with everything that we have to do with, yes, it, it all requires a lot of preparation, like um, Jose mentioned, I immense preparation. You really got to be comfortable with the subject you're teaching. Uh, you have to be so comfortable enough that it shows to your students. Because when you're not comfortable and when you don't know your subject, then all of that kind of pours out and you pour it out into your students and the students can feel it. So if you're comfortable with the uh, subject that you're teaching, you're gonna do great. And there's gonna be times when you're not gonna know the answer. And I always tell my students, just because I'm the professor doesn't mean I'm Einstein. Just like you, um, if I don't know it, hey, let's figure it out. Let's, you know, I'll look on my research, I'll look on my end and I'll ask around. I'll, I'll have colleagues that I'll email and say, hey, I have a student who, who um, asked me this, I know this much, but do you, have you heard anything? And so I bring those answers back. So it's okay to, um, I tell my students, just because I'm the professor doesn't mean I know everything, right? We, we're, not, we're not this super 
teacher who can see through everything. And I feel that students sometimes have that mentality and they're so scared to even ask a question. Yeah, um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Yadira. Um, that was a, a, a thoughtful uh, uh, overview on, on um, you know, how, how to better approach your students um, moving forward and starting like in your first year, right? Uh, where we hope many of the students that are participating now will be able to use uh, some of those uh, uh, some of those suggestions. Uh, thanks again, Yadira. And if we can hear from you now, uh, Skip. Well, one of, one of the things I'd like to mention, by the way, you guys did an excellent job of explaining that, and um, it's uh, and I and I can relate to many of those uh, experiences that you have. One of the things that I have found is that, um, especially going to a big university, uh, many of the professors that I dealt with, they were gods and goddesses in their field, and they wanted to, they wanted to let you know that. And I don't want, I, don't, I didn't want to, um, that, that was extremely intimidating, uh, especially if you are first year and you want to get into a field that you're pa very passionate about. And so one of the things I try not to do, and hopefully I'm, I'm successful at it, is be, be there for the students and let them know that even though I've been in this business for many, many years, there's still a lot of things that are new, that are developing, that are evolving, and that we don't necessarily have uh, the newest uh, information, but we are working toward making sure that we, we we teach to to the uh, to the uh, foundations in which, in, in my business, is to protect human health and the environment. So if you if you go in that path, and you you find the basics, these laws and regulations that we deal with on a day to day basis, that we must comply, the um, then you do you do yourself a big favor and just let people know that um, these things are going to evolve. That's one thing about the business that I'm in, it, it's always changing. Or I'll actually, in our business, everything continues to change, particularly now. I never thought I'd be doing this, okay, uh, on, on our computers. Uh, and uh, for me, this is very uncomfortable because I don't like sitting, I'd rather be in a big classroom uh, with, uh, with the students so I can see their faces, see their reactions, and, find out if they're paying attention. You can see it, 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 you get all these other nuances. And then also the, the, the wow factor. Wow, that was cool. Wow, that was, that was great to learn. You don't get that in, in, in this setting. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things, the downside about doing this. And obviously our classroom is what? It's theater. It's nice to be in the pit. Uh, for me, I like to be down there and and uh, being a, be an actor because it's it's fun, okay? It's fun, That's and to be fun. able to ar articulate yourself through hand gestures and through your body movements and things of that nature because that helps enhance the learning experience, which we it's lost when we're doing this. Yeah, um, uh, thank you so much, Skip. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward with uh, Carl, please. Yeah, so um, as far as time getting my credential, I was already working as a chiropractor, so I, it didn't really interfere with, uh, with that. Um, but what I wish I would have known or had, um, and you are all uh, ahead of me in this, is having a mentor. Uh, because when I first started teaching high school, I started halfway through the semester and there was already about five long-term subs that came in for a week and then left, came in for a week and then left. And so when I got there and I told them, you know, I'm your new teacher, they said, no, you're not, you'll be gone next week. And classroom management, if people don't think you're going to leave, they're not going to behave. And it was a, a real struggle in the beginning to figure out um, how to manage students. They all knew each other. They, you know, I didn't know any of their names. And if I had a mentor, I can reach out and say, hey, how, how should I approach this? what's a good way, you know. So, um, yeah, I would think, you know, if, if you have any other classes, try to try to make a connection with your teacher, especially maybe teachers that have a teaching style, teaching style that you like, um, and, and kind of form that bond and say, hey, maybe if it's not even a class you're with, can I just watch 
or maybe reach out and ask questions. Um, uh, now's the time where you know you could you could see the different teaching styles from different instructors in different departments. And um, I would say make those bonds and connections with teachers so that if you do have an issue that comes up, you have someone to reach out to. Awesome, thank you, Carl. And that's such a great uh, idea and suggestion. Uh, because, um, like I said, mostly all the students that are participating are Rio Honda College students, uh, which means that you can participate in the team mentorship program. So if you do end up uh, having an instructor, professor that you, uh, that you really like, you like uh, the way that they teach, you can approach them and ask them if they'd be interested in uh, being part of the team mentorship program. Uh, so this means that there is a chance for you to be matched with one of those instructors, even if it's uh, the first time. Uh, so just uh, something to keep in mind. Um, awesome. So uh, we are going to move on. This is a, a, another question submitted by one of our students, uh, and it's in reference to what's going on today. Uh, so uh, the question is, how have you handled uh, the, the recent transition to online uh, instruction? And we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Jose. Yeah, it's, you know, you guys, the students are also experiencing this new normal that we're all trying to get used to. Um, really something that this has really uh, influenced me in is my flexibility with the students. Um, I know that in a traditional setting, you try to keep a certain level of standards because that's what you're trying to have your classroom environment be. But now that everything's been tossed up, you still wanna keep a, a level of standards, but you have to understand that the things have changed for everyone. And so it's, it's forced me to reevaluate my level of flexibility with the students. And now I've become so much more, I feel like I've become so much more of a, of a instrument of, uh, for the students to find success because I've become more flexible. I, I, I'm trying to be more understanding. It, it, it's helped me a lot um, to go into this new setting, um, but it's also been very difficult. I mean, like Skip was mentioning, there's, not that interaction with students, the nuances, you, you don't see those things anymore. The, the wow moments aren't there. So it's just completely different now. And, uh, but there's still a lot to learn. As, as, a, as a teacher, you're always you know, learning. That's part of the profession is you're teaching, but you're also learning. And so that flexibility has been something that I've learned and, and become more adapt to and more sensitive to right now. Awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing, sharing, Jose. Uh, Brian, uh, what about you? Okay, everybody. Well, the transition was very difficult uh, to remote teaching because keep in mind, I teach kindergarten. So these kids have been exposed to technology, but not to the full extent like a third grader would or fourth, fifth or sixth grader would. So the first day of remote teaching was, you know, just learning how to navigate through certain platforms online and doing this or that. So our district gave us three days of planning. So that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, my colleagues and I, we, we met at school, we sat down and we said, okay, what are we gonna do? Are we going to send packets home? Are we going to you know, create some type of schedule online? What are we going to do? So you know, I, I tend to panic a little bit when, when I'm not in my level of comfort. And so that's something that I've been working on throughout these years because I've been told before, you know what, just control what you can and whatever you can't control, just let go. So obviously I can't control this, so I was having a hard time with it. Um, but you know what, with the support of my colleagues, I will, we were able to actually cr create a plan. We were actually to put together a, a weekly schedule and there we were able to insert links to have the kids and the parents click on and, you know, um, have them do their their online learning. And so we, we, we um, were able to, you know, give them their login codes and do this and do that. It was a lot of work to do that, but you know what, we got through it. So after two weeks of doing all of that, uh, the parents and the kids were finally able to get the hang of it. And now it's like, okay, we're moving on. We're moving along and everybody's doing great. And I mean, I have 28 kids, not all the kids are doing the work because of certain, you know, issues that they're having at home. Some kids don't have laptops, other kids don't have devices to work with at home. So there's only so much we can do. But out of the 28 kids, I have um, 20, 26 who are doing their work online. The other two are not, but again, there's only so much we can do. And um, yeah, we'll see how this goes because it's something new for everybody. So we're still exploring as we go along. 
right? Uh, where everyone's experiencing a learning curve right now, right? Um, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Brian. Uh, what about you, Yadira? So um, just like everybody, I think uh, adapting, um, it's not easy, uh, like Brian said, to lose control. Um, and I think that's kind of, I don't know if all you um, uh, professionals that I have here or colleagues, if you feel like that, but just having a little bit of control over your class, it's a sense of comfort. Um, so like Brian said, uh, losing that control um, was very, very hard for me in the beginning. I am a very, um, as you can see, I'm very touchy, very feely, very, let's sit down and talk about this. You're not understanding the lecture. What can I do? Let's track back. Uh, let's do something different. And right now I don't have the capabilities to really see my students because they can tell me yes online and they'll reply back like, yeah, everything's fine. But I don't know that I can see them. Um, and even if we do Zoom meetings, I, it's not the same for me, um, but I'm adapting. I've learned that even if I just check in with my students, uh, I just do a regular check-in. I don't do, I don't have class. Um, because there's so much pressure right now on everybody. So um, I just do check-ins. Check-ins to feel free to talk about what's bothering you, um, to vent. Um, I vent, they vent, and it feels like, okay, we, we've we kind of taken a breath. Okay, let's move now. Let's talk about the chapters. But um, that's how I've been adapting, trying to do Zoom once a week. I do check-ins with my students. Um, not all of them log in. Everybody has a different uh situation going on right now and so for me what's been helping me is that checking in with my students making sure that i at least i post like a zoom or i reach out to them um, while we adapt to this learning um, i do want to say that i have officially learned how to embed videos on my canvas and i am so excited so i'm sorry to any of my students but i've been bombarding <laughs> my canvas with videos because i've learned that and so um um, that's something that I'm, I'm planning on doing for the summer since it's remote uh, learning. I'm going to be uh, videotaping myself and then uploading it. I think it's called Pronopto on the Canvas. If you guys have heard it, it's an, a, a, an app on Canvas. Um, yeah, and it lets you record yourself and then it'll let you know when the students pause that section of the video and then went back, it alerts you. So then you know as a teacher like, oh, you know, maybe they were struggling with that part there. I don't know. I'm being nerd now. But um, yes, cool. that's how I'm adapting. Awesome. Um, well, it sounds like uh, it, it's it's a two-way street, right? Uh, our students are trying to adapt, uh, but also some of our instructors who might not uh, have had experience with online teaching already uh, are trying to learn it now, right? Uh, I just want to say that you're all very much appreciated. So keep keep on trucking. Uh, awesome. And we can hear uh, from Skip now. Well, let me just say this. I never thought I would be doing this. Okay, this is, again, uh, the classes that we teach or we provide in the ET program, it's not conducive to uh, Zoom teaching. We have to be out in the field. We have to be outdoors, okay, to do what we do. And so there's a military saying, you improvise, adapt, and overcome. So that's one of the things that I've been trying to, it, it, I actually I keep hearing that in my head. Let's just continue to do this until we're it's safe to go, go back to school, which I hope is going to be soon. And um, just uh, just push it on and cowboy up. And that's what that's what I've been doing. That's it. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Skip. And um, and uh, Carl, can we hear from you now? Sure, yeah, I was actually pretty lucky in the sense that uh, my master's degree program had a lot of uh, blended and online learning. So I was familiar with that uh, a while ago. And then when I started teaching at Rio Honda College, I taught uh, a hybrid class. I haven't, I've never taught a completely online class. Uh, so the, and the company I work for, the charter schools, I work for is blended learning. So we, it's kind of a hybrid type of thing as well. So I, I was really kind of positioned nicely for this. Um, but what I would say is it's a great learning experience that you're going through this as students because I, I would say eventually this is something that you, as a teacher you'd probably be an, end up doing. 
uh, and if not this, also hybrid. Um, and hybrid is a little bit more where um, you give maybe leading, uh, reading lessons and assignments and they do that online and then you come in maybe once or twice a week and you do like for my uh, situation, it would be for health sciences, you learn how to do actual blood pressure or body fat composition, things like that, where you have to be in front of someone. That's kind of the, 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 the hybrid model, but it's a good learning experience. And um, like I said, I've never done online, pure online. So it's a, the, the only thing I could think is that it's only gonna go more and more online like this. So um, there's a, an old book called Who Moved My Cheese? And you know, things happen and then you have to just figure out a way around it. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, this uh, online and hybrid type teaching is gonna be, um, I don't see it going away too much. I mean, I know that you know, our, our COVID situation will go away, but um, there's gonna be more and more technology-based instruction. So um, it's, it's, it's good that you get the experience of, of this online teaching now. Awesome, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing, Carl. Uh, we are nearing uh, the end soon uh and um there's uh just one more question that i think we 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 would love to hear from um and this is uh how do you take care of yourself so you don't burn out um there is a uh you know it's 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 common common sense that sometimes uh teaching can be a little exhausting right uh so our students would love to know what are some of the um techniques tactics that you use to uh sort of decompress and make sure that um, uh, that you're okay as far as your mental health, your physical health. Um, and if you can keep the answer uh, to uh, a little under a minute, that'd be great. Um, Jose, if you, if you don't mind starting us off. Um, yeah, something that helps with burnout that I found was getting involved in, in projects that you're passionate about. Um, there's so many things that teachers, uh, we have to make sure that we do a lot of different conferences and and all kinds of things that we have to do but it, finding something that you're passionate about within that you can do with the students a common passion um like for me i i found myself starting a lot of clubs and that helped me with the burnout um because it was just doing stuff that i enjoyed like we had an esports club where students got together and we competed on in games or we had a, an architecture and, and engineering club where students got together and we discussed things that I was passionate about and the students were passionate about. And that kind of helped me stay positive and keep from getting any sort of burnout. And naps, naps are very important. So make sure you guys take a lot of naps. Awesome, thank you so much, Jose. Uh, what about you, Brian? Okay, well, after school, after my school day is over, I usually go for a four mile, four mile jog around you know, the neighborhood. Um, I engage myself in my HIIT workouts right after I'm done with that. And then I take my dog on a walk or I watch my favorite TV shows like How to Get Away with Murder. Um, I listen to spa music. I usually do Zoom meetings with my friends and we have a uh, happy hour online and we play games and we talk because, you know, being isolated can only do so much for you. So you have to find ways to problem solve and, you know, communicate with people. So. That's what I usually do to, you know, to not burn myself out. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing, Brian. Uh, what about you, Yadira? Um, I, just the same thing. I think um, to me, what keeps me sane and I think what, uh, what, um, what was that word? What keeps me from burning out is really finding things like uh, Jose said, uh, finding things that are, are within you. Like uh, to me, I'm very passionate about students and you know making sure that we support our students so i am part of a teach collaborative um that i quite frankly to me that's sort of i love teaching but i also love doing things outside of my teaching world um to make my teaching world better so i don't know if that makes sense but it's outside to help my inside um and i like doing that and just like that i'd like to meditate i do meditate in the morning every morning to me it has worked tremendously and I actually um, recommend it to my mentees. Um, my mentees and I um, are meeting, sometimes we meet at 7 a.m. And I know that's crazy, but mm. um, getting them used to having, like we were talking about, just having time for yourself, even if it's for 10 minutes early in the morning before you do anything else, to kind of set your mind and your day will flow better. So having those 10, 15 minutes to yourself with no cell phone, with nothing but just you um, is very helpful for me. That helps me and it keeps me from the burnout. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Yadira. Uh, what about you, Skip? Daydream and alcohol <laughs> is really good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Romeo, you're so, oh, and I yeah. forgot to say that. Yeah, and wine, lots of wine. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cheese, wine, whatever, you, whatever your adult beverage uh, choice is, it, it always works. And I always like to also, um, if you have a passion, even though it's outdoors like myself, um, I have, uh, my thing is fishing, so that's my drug of choice. So I go and um, when, when I have an opportunity to uh, do some shopping, especially, uh, you know, when you got to get food, food is still essential. Well, uh, there's the Walmart, thank goodness, has food. And so they also have a sporting goods section. So I can linger around there for quite some time mm -hmm. and just uh, in, enjoy the uh, outdoor activities and equipment that they have, have offered, which I've all bought anyway. My wife tells me uh, my garage is a sporting goods store, and I go, "Okay, well, that's a good place to hang out." So find a find a place that uh, is peaceful for you, a quiet spot, and um, if you like to read, do that. And if you like to drink, not over excessively, of course, but um, have that opportunity too. So go for it. That's what, that's how I. Keep uh keep up uh keep up the uh keep up with the Joneses you might say. <laughs> yeah, and every every way of decompressing is valid, right? Uh, exactly. So, so that's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and what about you, Carl? Um, I would say find passions outside of work. Um, I love to travel. I've been to fifty four countries. Wow. Uh, as a as a teacher, you have the schedule set up that if traveling is your passion. And you want to make it work you could you could uh, travel for long long periods of time um, and I recommend doing that you know at this at this stage maybe when you graduate or something take a little bit of time and explore the world and you learn a little bit more about yourself and how uh, other people live and and the good cultures and the differences between other places and here and how great we have it as well here um, I would also say is find have good relationships with people that you can talk to they don't have to be teachers they just have to be people that can put themselves in your shoes and put themselves in your student's shoes so that um, maybe you're you know really frustrated about something and it's just someone to look at things through a different viewpoint and say well what about this and then it puts everything in a different uh, frame so uh, just having uh, connections and good friends with people that you know if you're having if you're struggling with with work that you could just have someone to talk to Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, um, Carl, and, and all of you, really, uh, thank you for taking some time to, to meeting with us and, and our students. I think this has been a, a super beneficial and rich experience for everyone. Um, so we, uh, yeah. If I may um, uh, make an announcement before we end. So in May, I would like to announce that we will actually, as part of our LA Teach Collaborative, we will be offering a series of virtual workshops on different topics that are related to teaching and they will be geared for faculty or students or both so watch out for them uh, we will be announcing it soon uh, it will be off or hosted by different um, teacher preparation community colleges so it'll be an exciting uh, event for us uh, um, to commemorate or to appreciate our teachers in may um, so you can attend any of the workshops that you want. And for those uh, of you who are part of our mentoring program, you can actually uh, apply the hour that you spent in these um, uh, virtual meetings into your mentoring requirement as well. Leah, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, right now that you mentioned that uh, the mentees that are, well, my mentees are going to be providing a workshop, the school and life management. Um, will those hours also apply to them or how would that work? Definitely. Any workshop that they attend uh, uh, within this uh, virtual workshop series that we're going to be offering, they can apply it towards that, um, the mentoring requirement. Okay. Thank you, Yadira. Uh, awesome. And uh, just to find out announcement to our students, if you uh, are part of a team mentorship uh, right now, you will be uh, able to earn an hour towards your uh, time commitment. Uh, by completing the um, uh, the one page uh, 
that was sent to you. So just answering a couple of questions about your experience today. Um, and that is it. Again, thank you so much for uh, joining us and hopefully we get to do this sometime soon, right? Thank you, <laughs> bye. Right, folks, thank you so much, we'll be in touch. Thank you everyone. Thank you.